Hello, everyone. I'm Miriam Knight. Welcome to New Consciousness Review. Our guest today is Julia Asante, an established social historian of the ancient Near East with a PhD from Columbia University. She has taught at Columbia, Bryn Mawr, and the University of Münster, and lectured worldwide. But for over 35 years, she has also been an active professional intuitive medium and past life therapist. And her accuracy in telepathy has been clinically tested at Columbia University. She's just come out with a new book called The Last Frontier, Exploring the Afterlife and Transforming Our Fear of Death. In it, she applies the combined insights and methodologies she gained from both fields in a uniquely rigorous investigation of where we go after we die. So buckle your seatbelts and enjoy the ride. Welcome, Julia Asante. Oh, Miriam, thank you so much for inviting me on. Well, I am so delighted to have had this opportunity, not only to meet you in person, but to get to read this fascinating book, all 367 pages of it. Thank you very much. (laughs) Yes, it was originally uh, much longer. Oh, my God. (laughs) I know. Sometimes it's much easier to do long than short. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So, Julia, tell me what inspired the shift from being an academic to studying the afterlife and talking with dead people? A number number of things. The um, intuitive side of me has always been very strong, and suppressing it in order to stay in the academic world was becoming an unbearable pressure. So that that was one thing. I had to make a decision about that. But... um, Mainly it it derives from uh, one single event. As an intuitive, uh, I've been working since the mid-70s with uh, deceased. One, as in a normal session, a private session, gets some sort of message frequently from the folks on the other side. There have been a series of events afterwards where I started working with people on the other side who had difficult difficulties in transiting. But this one event uh, happened while I was in graduate school of a man who I love very dearly. And when I saw, when we finally made contact and I saw the relief on his face, the profound gratitude, the euphoria that someone could still see him, perceive him in any way, hear him in any way, that he was still counted as a human being, that he still existed to someone. That was when I made the vow to write this book one day. And that session with him, which, which was spontaneous, he, he came to me shortly after his death, Um, that lasted for over an hour and it was, uh, questions and answers. It was disagreements. It was joking. Uh, it, it combined almost all ranges of human emotion, even a little bit of anger. And, uh, when I realized that everyone can have this and what this can do for us in terms of our understanding of the afterlife or in terms of, of how we die, um, uh, in terms of grief, um, there was no no question that I was going to write this. How powerful. Yeah, it was. It was. And it's continued to this day. And that, that event opened up an enormous portal, in which I had after death communication uh, in, of people in my private life that were absolutely outstanding. And yet, one could say that the fear of death is really what keeps the world in check, what runs the world. Where where does that stem from? Uh, it stems from um, seventh century BC Judaism, and that's a bit of a history there. But uh, where when the afterlife and contact with uh, uh, the dead, which which archaeologists like myself call ancestors, is a bit of a misnomer, was basically it was outlawed. Um, the afterlife more or less disappeared in Judaism. Um, the God of the living, as, as Yahweh was called, uh, was not concerned with them. So there was already then a sense of um, the afterlife being territory one does not explore. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, um, death itself was conceived or construed as a punishment in the creation story. So I think we've inherited a lot on that end. 
religions certainly have uh, manipulated the afterlife in order to uphold their own hierarchies and structures with a reward punishment system, whether it's in reincarnation, um, a bad one coming if you've been immor immoral in this life, or heaven, hell, and purgatory setups. Mm -hmm. So we, we have a lot of it inherited, <clears throat> excuse me, from the religious end, but then uh, uh, when you start to add in the mix of this profoundly materialist orientation of science in the 20th century, uh, you start getting a pull from the science end of the afterlife being uh, a fiction of an illusion. And so from both ends, you have a lot of trouble. <laughs> I, I was actually, um, in my question, kind of thinking about... Um, sin and judgment, obedience and disobedience, going right back to Adam and Eve and Abraham. I thought it was very amusing that um, you associate Eve with disobedience and Abraham with obedience. Women are to a woman. frequently associated with uh, disobedience. If you look at uh, uh, the uh, cursing of apostasy in the Old Testament, apostasy meaning non-believers or idol worshippers or whatever, uh, unfaithful, there, there are often uh, conflated with or uses metaphor for the unfaithful wife, the uh, adulteress. And that's caused a lot of confusion in the Bible. So Yahweh is the, is the male mate and the faithful are his wives. And this is a metaphor that runs throughout the Old Testament. The whore Babylon is not about a whore. It's about Babylon being a place of, of um, unfaithfulness in which the Jews went and spent some time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in the so all this faithfulness is really uh, a kind of a rod with which to chastise anybody who steps out of line. Yeah, never done before <laughs> in a religion. It, it's just amazing to me. And so... Uh, at that time when this, this, I call it a cult. I hate, hate to, uh, uh, say that sort of, uh, publicly, but it, it was a cult. It was a forming cult against, uh, uh, canon and canonic cults, canine cults at the time. Um, the use of sin, of abomination against a single god was unprecedented. And this is something you can actually track to about fifth century BC. So the notion of sin, is quite new, and it's probably the worst thing that ever happened to humanity. It's well, being, of course, disobedience, really. Sure, but the notion of sin um, plays into the fear of death, because yes. the fear of death is is instilled because you, you believe that um, you will suffer in hell or you will suffer some mighty punishment uh, if you don't toe the line. And... So you could say that your book and, and your, your life's work, in, indeed, to relieve the fear of death is pretty darn revolutionary. <laughs> well, you know, when you look at how our society is constructed around it, it's quite shocking. And not only is it constructed around it, but uh, our society and the industries within it and the institutions within it have learned to exploit that fear. And that fear is making a fortune. Um, the uh, societies like for uh, certain kinds of research for fatal diseases can get up to two billion a year in donations. Um, the uh, health and beauty industry is raking it in. The news and entertainment industry provide a steady feed of gruesome deaths uh, and uh, other sorts of turmoil that lead to death disasters and natural disasters or war or whatever. That's the way we teach history too. So medical industries, insurance, pharmaceuticals, uh, certainly the war industry, uh, certain branches of the government, and even, I must say, um, judicial systems, we, we really do operate constantly under this gun, and uh, it's growing, it's not lessening, it's growing, this um, fighting the, uh, the slide toward death, fighting death itself, understanding death as a pathology, which is the last thing that it is. It's an act of incredible creation. Uh, this, is, this is disrupting our natural cycles, 
um, and in creating tremendous amount of tension and havoc. It's also creation, creating overpopulation and greed. Mm-hmm. Okay, so tell us how, what is your conception of what death really is and how did you come to it? Uh, let me, let me address the first, the second question first. I, I came to it because I look at the material. I look at my own experience and analyze it. I analyze the material as a production of consciousness that existed in time and place. In other words, what I look at is modern Western humans. And so that the afterlife experiences that I am looking at, I understand within that context. Um, that it is, a um, uh, uh, the afterlife, death itself, let's, let's get back a little bit. Death itself, the dying process itself is being recognized more and more by medical personnel and particular hospice nurses who are beginning to see the miraculous aspects of it. This is something that has intrigued me for many, many years, and I've been around an awful lot of deaths. Um, how the, the psyche pulls together events and people uh, even their, their personal biology in order to achieve reconciliation, for instance. Um, it's a tremendously creative process. It involves a highly accelerated growth uh, rather than decay and uh, growth that is meant to catapult the psyche out of the body, more or less. We also now know of a thing, new thing called nearing death awareness, which is where people... Uh, in the dying process, begin to develop um, uh, incredible skills or psychic skills or intuitive skills in which they have deathbed visions, such as uh, seeing uh, those from the other side coming to escort them or coming to give them messages. More and more uh, medical personnel and caregivers are seeing these uh, deceased individuals themselves. Um, death, deathbed visions also, of course, include visions of the afterlife just before entry. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's so many things that go on in the dying process. And I think that people who are um, at all there, who are not too much interfered with by uh, the needs of the hospital and hospitals um, and, and, and doctors and whatever, actually do feel this opening threshold, this spacious moment that seems to get bigger and bigger and include all of us. I know of no one who hasn't um, wondered at the last words of the dying or the last gestures of the dying. We know and feel the depth of it. And it's time for us to celebrate that. And it's time for us to stop looking at death as a failure and see it for what it is, which is a miraculous creative act. You need to expand upon that, because when you're talking about a creative act, you're talking about the next act. So what is the next act? The the next act is the changing of focus from physical to non-physical. And we call it non-physical right now in the the context we're speaking today. We call it afterlife, but truthfully, it isn't that. It's not after anything. It's just the non-physical dimensions, and that includes an awful lot, Miriam. It includes also the pre-born so this misnomer, I think, we're just getting used to afterlife now, so I more or less am letting that slide and not going to talk <laughs> about that. But at some point, when we get more sophisticated and more is known, um, and I hope more is known uh, by, by study, by examination, by investigation and personal experience, but by discriminating investigation, uh, when we get to that point, we might be secure enough in survival to start looking at our idea of an afterlife and expand it to include all non-dimension, non-physical dimensions. Well, in parallel with your uh, description of the various stages of life or, or, or a being, I should say, um, you also have an interesting description of time. You, have, you talk about sequential and simultaneous and interactive time. Tell us how they interrelate. We, you know, um, if we even thought about time and the way we live it now, I mean, think about the second. The second was invented, I think, maybe 200 years ago or, or less. <laughs> you know, we're living in a completely artificial construction of time as it is. Our idea of time is really only how our nervous systems organize data, whether it's solar data or it's... Uh, 
the data of what we perceive of uh, as events. It's an organizational tool, but time in itself doesn't really exist 